Welcome to my basement shop, the place um, my kids and I have been spending a lot of time right now. Um, it's a little messy. Uh, that's how my kids keep it. And I've learned to let it stay messy for a while. I'd like to share with you a little bit today about my experience making things and how that has grown into interesting and I think very relevant experiences with my children as we make things at home. And I want to explore this concept of making and how it's really a timeless concept. However, one I think that is um, under great threat today. So the conversation goes something like this with my kids. Dad, can you take us to the hardware store? Why? We need some PVC pipe. What for? Well, since our last bow didn't work, we want to make a better one. And this has really been my life story for the past few years. I've blogged about it before as well, and you can find some information about that there. But um, whether it's PVC pipe, a PVC pipe cutter, PVC pipe glue, heat gun tire valves to pressurize, valves to release pressure, string and more string, laser pointers, bolts to mount cameras, wire, duct tape, old guitars, spray paint, sandpaper. We are certainly keeping the local hardware store in good business. We make lots of trips there. Somehow, m my kids end up with the very things I won't buy them, because in the end they make them. And this is, in this case, a, a longbow. So let me tell you about this. Yes, they've made blowguns, paintball launchers, rocket launchers, camera stabilizers, and so much more. And I hadn't given into their pleading for a bow and arrow because, you know, as you know, in a neighborhood where there are houses fairly close to one another, things like arrows can be hazardous uh, as well as make it difficult for um, neighborly relationships, shall we say. However, when my kids want to make things, I find I just can't say no. Um, where do they get this passionate desire to make stuff from? I think from their dad, from me. And I think I got it from my dad as well. And he probably got it from his dad and so on. However, I think there's an innate desire in all of us to make cool stuff, things that are meaningful and interesting to us, whatever those things might be. I think makers are timeless. Dale Dougherty, the founder of the maker movement, makes a really good point in this regard. Here he is talking about the timelessness of makers and an unfortunate shift, I think, in culture as we have progressed. Maybe the 1960s or, or so, things like tinkering were more mainstream. Uh, they were like middle class virtues. If you could improve your home or repair your car, well, you saved some money, you got something that might have been hard to get otherwise, as you couldn't pay for it, and so you were smarter, you were, you were um, resourceful. And I, I think that kind of mindset is, is just important. For many years, or many, um, almost decades, we've kind of talked ourselves out of being makers, that we're, we're smart shoppers or consumers. And, and I really want to turn that around and say we, we are makers. We, we make our world. Indeed, for many of us and our children, our students as well, I think the emphasis has really shifted to being smart consumers, both of goods and information, and less so on creators, tinkerers, and makers. Um, of course, in many ways, the tools of the trade have also changed. Electronics, the internet, and connected digital devices, ubiquitous devices that record video, miniaturization of circuits and processors, these all bring about new possibilities for making and inventing things. The timelessness of inventing does indeed evolve, but as Dale points out, I think, making doesn't have to be complex, reserved for geniuses, or only high-tech. Um, here's what he has to say about that that innovation and making and creating is, is, is kind of an everyday thing that lots of people do. It's not, it doesn't have to be elevated. It's not something that just geniuses do. It's, we're all inventors. We're all makers. So even as I think we've shifted away from making as more of a necessity, the innate desire within us to create things, interesting things, really remains. Um, we come to understand ourselves and our world through interacting with it. And part of that comes from making things. Here's a simple example of something just like this that happened at our house the other day. My son bought an old SLR film camera and a few rolls of film at a garage sale. 
the camera looked functional, and he thought he could understand the concept of film cameras and film from what he had read. And I should add, he's become quite knowledgeable um, using a DSLR camera and understanding some of that. So he certainly came into it with some good background knowledge. But anyway, he loaded the film and took his 24 photos, and a few days later brought the film to our local Sam's Club to be developed. <laughs> Amazing, they still develop film. Um, but an hour or so later, we get a call from the developer that the film was blank and likely never advanced through the camera um, as the photos were taken. So even though my son had some knowledge about how it all worked, he never had the opportunity to actually try it. So since he had a second roll of film, this time I guided him through the process of threading the end of the film through the slot of the spindle, you remember those things? So that this time, the film advance lever would actually pull the film through the camera and across the shutter and the lens. And I thought it was a perfect example of learning through failure and learning through actually interacting with the medium rather than just reading about it. And it made me think how much of school today is reading about things rather than really interacting with them and the concepts that they imbue in meaningful and active ways. Here's a boy talking about this very concept as he gets to explore his world in ways never before experienced in the classroom. And that, of course, I think is the tra tragedy here. Had you, had you done this kind of work before? I No, nothing like... I've always played with electricity, but just lighting up a light with a switch, <laughs> nothing really this advanced, so it's it's a lot of fun. Would you have learned this in, in your regular school or no? No, definitely not in regular school. I mean, I never would have had this opportunity, so this has been really cool. And too often we try to cram innovation or creativity in our little boxes of learning in the same way we're so rushed to cover curriculum. It's just far too easy to use the words creativity, innovation projects, yet really fall short of really making these things authentic and meaningful for kids. And Dale goes on to say this. You know, it's not something you tell someone to innovate. It's like creativity. You don't tell people to be creative. You invite them to, you know, and you open the context for them to do that. Right, right. So it really resonates inside of them. You know, it's not something you impose on them. Yeah. So back to my kids and their making of the longbows. As I entered the garage, the scene before me made this really real. Here it is. Do you notice something? Look at these photos. All the typical tools are strewn about in the typical kid fashion, yet the iPad sits amongst them all, another tool. I didn't suggest that my son do this. He just does it, naturally. His access to experts, experience, multimedia, social connectivity, they open up a world to him that even I may not have experienced. And in a sense, it's a little bittersweet because he doesn't need his dad working with him as much as he used to. But like a good dad, I really admire him for growing up, becoming both responsible and independent. And now my younger son has now become his apprentice, working alongside his older brother, making cool stuff. My wife isn't always as happy about all of this, as she has a different tolerance for danger, as moms often do. She wasn't raised making things and using tools, and I guess that's why having two parents with different experiences can be so valuable to children. Not to mention that dads often have a bent for higher risk and maybe just a tad more impulsiveness, um, sometimes without using your head. <laughs> I love that my kids make things. They watch very little TV. They read. They read and watch, mostly YouTube, for the purposes of making things. My oldest son learned to play guitar on YouTube and still turns to YouTube to learn new riffs from his experts. My youngest son turns to the internet and often YouTube for just about everything as well. What to look for in a new camera, how to program in Scratch, how to make a bottle rocket, and just about everything else that he's curious about, knowing and, and even making. But, but here's the thing. They go to school and largely sit in desks and listen to teachers who tell them things, good things, and they write these things down, often parrot them back, practice and have to remember. This model of learning worked for older generations because they didn't have access to the fantastic tools that allow for much more learning independence and creativity. But this has changed. However, in our institutions of mass production, mass education, it's not always so easy, and, and I'll be the first to admit that. 
Maybe that's part of the problem. But it is possible, and it's happening all over the world in schools and classrooms. In Gary Steger and Sylvia Martinez's new book, Invent to Learn, they write this, and it really resonates. The maker movement not only blurs the artificial boundaries between subject areas, it erases distinctions between art and science, while most importantly obliterating the crippling practices of tracking students in academic pursuits or vocational training. There are now multiple pathways to learning that we have always taught and things to do that were unimaginable just a few years ago. And I couldn't agree more. In an article from Make Magazine, the reason suggested is one that I've been right talking about here. And they put it this way, to quote, The funny thing is that people have been doing this DIY making forever, but now it's a movement. And why is that? And the answer is simple. The internet. The internet has become more and more deeply embedded in our society. The ability for people with specific hobbies to connect with others who share their passions for DIY electronics or felting, Doctor Who characters or building fire-breathing sculptures has become easier and easier. Passionate makers find other passionate makers. They share, collaborate, create, and thrive. They come together in online and real space communities and big events and show off what they're doing. They realize there are enough people like them or enough people who like what they're doing that perhaps they can build a small business around it. And they run crowdfunding campaigns. They succeed and provide a model for the next maker to try something else. They show each other a path to tread. This has become much more of a virtual, digital, and social apprenticeship model of learning. Are schools today tapping into the vast wealth of this opportunity? Things like the flipped classroom try, but I think really fall short in so many ways. Not that this model doesn't succeed in other ways. Maybe the flipped model of learning needs not only to change the learning structure, but also the notion of expert and learning community. Mimi Ito discusses a, a really important distinction between how kids use the internet, used for what she calls friendship-based activities and entertainment, and also used for passion-based, interest-based, or geeking around or tinkering types of activities. Here's what she has to say. There really is a gap in perception and understanding between generations about the value of engagement with online activities. And so in the adult world, there was a, a general perception that when kids are in front of the screen or messing around with their computer, that it's a waste of time, uh, that it's taking away from more productive activities, healthier activities, whereas kids ascribe much more value to the, those activities. And that's, in a way, not so different from, you know, an earlier generation trying to get your teenage daughter off the phone or trying to get uh, your son to come in uh, from playing with their friends to focus on their homework. But I think there's a more general perception in the culture around new media that is associated with entertainment media and other forms of just mediated activity that it is inherently um, a space that is hostile to learning. And that's the perception that I think we really need to work against. And part of it is understanding the differences between different kinds of online activities. So friendship-driven activity is very different from interest-driven activity. And if you lump them all together, you're actually missing the opportunity for learning that's in the space and also not recognizing the sort of baseline social learning that's happening in the friendship space. So I don't think it's that we should abandon formal learning at school. We need formal learning. But I think rather we, we need to better coordinate these powerful forms of informal and creative learning that can and should happen away from school and spill over into school, and vice versa. Um, in general, I don't think we've done a very good job of understanding these more passion-driven spaces and connective technologies that empower learners and help operationalize passion and interest, not to mention just expanding our kids' and students' horizons in terms of what is possible and how new tools are being used in exciting and powerful ways to support learning. 
about is how we support kids' engagement in the more messing around and geeking out space. And this is the space that really has the opportunity to foster kids' intellectual development, their civic engagement, uh, their personal development in really important ways. And yet we haven't really worked as educators or parents to proactively engage kids. In any event, my kids will continue to follow their passions and make things. It, it just saddens. It's just sad to see them more excited to come home to learn than they are to go to school and learn. Um, subjects that should be fascinating and truly engaging are often drudgery or simply wrote for them. I've personally witnessed over the years that classroom projects are going the way of the dinosaur. Salt over leaf maps, building a model of colonial Jamestown out of popsicle sticks and found objects, developing a business, creating a giant polyhedron. One of the latest innovations, the digital textbook, <laughs> just can't compensate for the disappearance of making projects and solving problems, as nice as embedded and interactive media is. The increasingly oppressive trend to deliver content and assess recall on that content, how does passion-based learning fit in with this paradigm? A teacher describes it this way in this video. When all I bring home is a piece of paper and I pick B instead of C, I don't have a lot to talk about with my parents. And because I picked C and the answer was B, I don't want to talk about it. So if I'm bringing home something I made, and it's right because I made it, it was my plan, or I know how to fix it, I've got a lot to do at home. So ask yourself today, what do I want to make? Ask your own children what they want to make. And finally, if, if you dare, ask your students what they want to make. They may surprise you. There's so many ways to tie real, interesting, and passion-driven projects to the curriculum. If a 10th grade English teacher in Cleveland can use a three-legged iron bracket that holds the legs of a chair as a catalyst for learning about Ralph Waldo Emerson's self-reliance in themselves, then surely we can tap into the rich world around us and the passions and interests of our students and their world as we help them understand it all. Here's a little bit from the WikiSeat project and the teacher who started this. If there's one thing that we really need in education, it's students who understand that problems are solvable if we can learn. We're learning for the wrong reason in education right now. It's to prove that we know things. We should prove, uh, we should learn to solve problems things. The basic idea is, what do you want to make? Right. Right? You can feel the energy in here. Yeah. I mean, they just came right in and immediately right. got to work. Right. So my advice to you, go make things. If you have kids, you know, go make interesting things with them. What do they want to make? Ask your students, what do they want to make and how can you connect that to curriculum? Uh, how can you leverage new tools in interesting ways that empower them to create things? Um, as with the picture of my son at the workbench with the iPad there, that iPad wasn't there to access a digital textbook. It wasn't there to uh, play an interactive game or app to simulate something. That iPad was there as an integral tool into pursuing his passions. It was connecting him to communities. It was connecting him to expert uh, instruction, uh, whether it be video-based or text-based. Um, it was his go-to place to free him, to help him to be independent, to help him follow his passion, to help him um, pick his own path. Um, this is the way tools today um, should be leveraged in our classrooms. And I think as some of this content that I shared with you has pointed out, it has really missed the mark. So let's all get back to using tools in really relevant and real ways to make things, make things of interest, make things that are exciting, um, and to understand that there's this whole environment, as Mimi Ito talked about, where um, we can immerse ourselves not in friendship and and entertainment-driven types of spaces and tools, but in passion-based, in tinkering and geeking out times of types of places and spaces where truly interesting things can be made and the process of making those things can be supported in so many ways. So, go make something.
orange. And he stirs it. He mixes it. So the other thing went more yellow in there. Okay. Maybe he swirled it. There's a lot of red in the center. Yeah. You can put that on. want green. Alright, take the can mark. Alright, hopefully this turns out well. I love aiming stuff. Oh yeah? Yep. Don't spray the guitar, you blew it right off the guitar. And there you go. My guitar. Yeah, you loosen that. Ooh yeah. Ooh yeah. Lots of green. Yeah. Well the green and, um, the, and there's a bunch and more the, on the back. See it looks like there's none here. Yeah, there's like none there. And there. Mm -hmm.